Hi guys, it's Mrs. Schacht here, and I'm here to discuss foreign policy initiatives under William McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt. Um, William McKinley served from 1897 to 1901, and everything in the slide deck that you're going to see in red were events that took shape under his presidency. Um, when he was assassinated in 1901, his vice president, Teddy Roosevelt, assumed the presidency. Everything in blue happened under Roosevelt's presidency. And then everything in yellow is actually, here we go here, a Quizlet term. So you did just hear about the Spanish-American War, which was probably the largest foreign policy event of McKinley's presidency. But there were a few other things that took shape immediately after. And the first thing I'm going to discuss is the open door policy. This refers specifically to China. What does it mean? Well, essentially, other European countries like Japan, Russia, um, France, Great Britain, and Germany all had what was referred to as a sphere of influence in China. What that meant was that they, come, they controlled different trading ports and they were trading with China and kind of had free reign to do so. And so it was important to McKinley and many others that the United States also have a sphere of influence carved out. So McKinley instructed his Secretary of State, John Hay, to send a note to the rest of these European countries, which basically said, hey, you know, it's important that we all have equal access to China and we would like to be a part of this as well. And what's interesting is that his note didn't require any level of response. So he took the lack of response as one of acceptance and the United States was able to get in on the trade game. However, um, very quickly thereafter, um, there was a rebellion brewing in China that became known as the Boxer Rebellion. And this was actually a response by a group of a um, Chinese nationalists, and it was a secret society that were essentially against foreign influence and attacked um, Christian missionaries and different foreign encampments. And the United States ended up sending approximately 5,000 troops in to help squash this rebellion. And as a result, John Hay sent a second note um, to these other European powers that said, you know, we're just trying to preserve China and make sure that everybody can trade in a fair and safe manner. So those are some of the things that were implemented under McKinley. But when Teddy Roosevelt assumed office, there were um, a lot of his foreign policy initiatives were kind of um, mostly limited to Central and South America. So first and foremost, he had a motto and a uh, foreign policy mindset. Um, and it was based on this phrase, speak softly and carry a big stick. So use diplomacy, but also use a little force. And whenever we refer to the big stick diplomacy, which you can see in these cartoons, that's referring to the power of the United States Navy. And Teddy Roosevelt used the Navy quite a bit during his presidency. One of the examples of that is the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. So you guys Hopefully, remember the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, um, when President Monroe basically sent a message to Europe and said, hey, we're in charge of the Western Hemisphere. We will keep you know, Central and South American powers safe from European influence. Well, Teddy Roosevelt's corollary or his addition to that was, actually, the United States has an unrestricted right to essentially meddle in the affairs of Central and South American countries. And that'll happen in places like Haiti, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. We will send troops in our Navy there. But probably the biggest event um, that serves as an example of that is the building of the Panama Canal. So if you want to have an aggressive naval force, right? It's important to have a naval presence. And one of the things that Teddy Roosevelt quickly realized was that there needed to be a much quicker access point from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And what better way to do so than to build 
a canal directly through Panama. Now, this was not a new idea, and this was something that the French had tried. Um, the British were interested in building a canal as well. And right off the bat, excuse me, Teddy Roosevelt um, approached both the French and the British um, we ended up signing a treaty with the British in 1901, and they basically gave us the opportunity to build this canal alone. Now, one of the sticking points initially was that Colombia controlled the Isthmus of Panama and obviously did not want the United States to be digging through. And so Teddy Roosevelt in 1903 basically orchestrated a revolution in which the people of Panama were able to achieve independence without bloodshed um, and basically drove the Colombians out. Um, it's important to note, though, that in 1921, we did pay Colombia $25 million for this insurrection. But this gives the United States the opportunity to build this canal. Now, this does not come without its challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges that the French actually faced were diseases um, from the mosquitoes, as well as obviously the fact that it's a fairly dangerous and very, um, very difficult labor intensive job. When it came to building the canal itself, um, immediately 60,000 laborers were hired and through the course of the next 10 years from 1904 to 1914, um, we saw laborers from all sorts of countries participating in the construction of this 51 mile canal. Um, it did open in 1914, and it's one of the few government projects that I believe opened on time and under budget, which doesn't happen very often. But again, this gives the United States Navy the power to not only control who's using the canal, but we're able to quickly travel from the Pacific to the Atlantic and vice versa. Um, in 1999, we did give um, complete control of the canal zone back to Panama, but believe it or not, for that, since 1904 um, to 1999, the United States did control it, which is a kind of a long time. <laughs> um, Teddy Roosevelt also um, got involved in Asian affairs. Um, Whereas McKinley dealt more specifically with China, um, Teddy Roosevelt turned his attention, oh, sorry, this is distracting, um, to what was happening in Japan. And in 1905, um, the Russo-Japanese War was taking place. Um, this was a conflict between Russia and Japan. And Teddy Roosevelt decided that it was important to the United States and to potential um, trade in Asia that this end peacefully. So he arranged a conference where he sat down with both parties. Um, the Japanese did feel pretty slighted by um, the actual outcome of this agreement, um, but it did end peacefully and Teddy Roosevelt was actually awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his involvement. Um, that didn't stop the fact that there were still issues with Japan. So here in the United States, um, there were many Japanese immigrants living and working on the West Coast, and um, they were subject to a lot of discrimination, um, specifically in schools out in California. So one of the things that Teddy Roosevelt did um, agree to was a gentleman's agreement of source sorts in 1907. Uh, he essentially agreed to prosecute and um, basically get rid of the discriminatory practices that were happening to the children of Japanese immigrants in schools in California. And secretly, the Japanese government decided to restrict immigration to the United States. The final thing that I'm going to mention is the Great White Fleet. Um, so what I always think is kind of fascinating is that during this time period, it wasn't uncommon for countries to send their Navy kind of on a mission. Um, and they would basically take some of their biggest and best warships and they would station them 
throughout the world um, to kind of deflex our, our naval muscles, so to speak. But he sent our U.S. Navy, the Great White Fleet, kind of on a tour, as you can see here, um, all over the world, essentially, to show our power and our might to the rest of the world. Um, that, hopefully, guys, gives you a little bit of what happened between McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt. Um, obviously, the Spanish-American War kind of cracked open this drive for imperialism. Um, McKinley will get that started in Asia, and then Teddy Roosevelt will continue um, to create an American foreign policy initiative um, that is built primarily on our Navy. And you're going to see how um, William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson either do or do not kind of carry on some of those ideas. Have a great day.